Hi, I'm Diane Hullett and welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. I'm excited today to have kind of a different sort of guest. Today, my guest is Joyce Foistel and Joyce is a social media tutor. She goes by the handle Boomer Social Media Tutor and I was totally intrigued by that. So we connected through LinkedIn and through some mutual friends and we just thought we'd have kind of an interesting conversation mm -hmm. about aging, social media, and how that all fits in. So welcome, Joyce. Well, it's great to be on your program. This is exciting. I think this is going to be really fun because, um, you know, both of us kind of shook up our lives midlife and started kind of different careers all of a sudden in the middle of things. And of course, careers right now require a certain amount of social media. So, you know, just tell us a little, what's your background and how did you get into this work of social media tutoring and training? Well, I'm going to start way back when and then skip a few decades. So I'm born in 1948. If you think about girls that just look a little bit older than you, when they were graduating high school in the 60s, what do they do? They would be a teacher like my mom. They might be a nurse, might be a secretary. There was a traditional role. So I thought I'd be a teacher. I got a couple degrees in teaching even from the University of Wisconsin, but teaching turned out wasn't a fit for me. Mostly because of my temperament. I'm just not that structured. I don't do well with rules and bells and things that really are required in um, public school education for sure. So at any rate, I tried different careers in my 20s. Nothing really panned out very well. I was a home mom for most of my 30s and into my early 40s. I worked for my church for a year. I was kind of an administrative assistant. Then, then, then we came out here in 95 from Wisconsin, I should say, out here to Denver, Colorado, Madison, Wisconsin to Denver, Colorado. And then after about a Actually, even about a year of being here, I fell into sales. Then I worked in sales for the Chamber of Commerce, Better Business Bureau, and University of Phoenix. And then where I'm going to answer your question finally is I was working for uh, a very niched college um, professional training for people in financial planning. And it was 2010. I was there from 06 to 13. And in 2010, the college rolled out its social media. So if we take ourselves back, you know, 13 years, 13 and a half years to be specific. And think about it, it was before Instagram came out. So you just had LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter and our college got on all three. And we and the um, inside sales team, AKA enrollment advisors were asked to help out the college and do the right thing and talk up the social media. Well, so my manager at 35, he was listening to me, what, you know, just observing me at 61, 13 years ago, be quite proficient, actually, in, in this assignment. I was very excited. I've explained the Facebook page and the LinkedIn group and the Twitter account. And hey, why don't you just track along with us on these? And they kept track. They would pay us even a $5 spiff, as they call it in sales, every time we got someone to engage with our social media, or at least follow along with it, I should say. So my manager was so intrigued that he said to me about three months into this little rollout, Joyce, he said, since you are so clearly good, so, so, so good at getting the people from the college to engage in our social media. Have you ever thought of helping other people, especially in your baby boomer generation to understand social media like you, like you understand it, that I could help them to understand it. And I thought, what a compliment coming from the 35 year old to my 61 year old self on the age of his mom and dad. So that's how I got into it really is because someone saw that I could have an aptitude for helping people understand social media. Right, because I think there is this sort of attitude among people over 60, maybe that that is kind of, you know, they're, they've either followed along with it and kept up with it, or they're just kind of overwhelmed. They're like, really, why bother? How would I even get started? So, I mean, what's your take on how, you know, let's just go big picture for a second. Yeah. Like, how has social media in a mere 13 years, like that astounds me that it's only been that long. In 13 years, how have you seen social media shape business and, and culture and people's individual experiences? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, we could take it almost back 20 years, just to be specific, because that's when, the you know, the major ones rolled out, the mid-2000s. I actually did a little Google search on that, because I thought, I want to see what, what they say. And one of the, some of the key things they say in my very informal search is that you have this ability, for better or for worse, to communicate instantaneously around the world, across cultures. 
So there is an equalizing, in a sense, of the playing field in, in many different ways. So that is one way, just the style of communication and that people then can have a cause, again, for better, for worse, and it can just generate all this momentum that would be much more difficult to do prior to social media. It's hard, hard, even, hard to even imagine that time. And then even small businesses without a lot of resources can, for no money or minimal money, can really have a presence, can really stand out. And, and people say, oh, who's so-and-so? So I think it's really given this, the micro businesses, solopreneurs, small businesses, a lot of tools that really we didn't have before from a marketing standpoint. And also I think in a really sweet way, having family all over the world is it helps people say connected, I'll use Facebook. I mean, now I know when the babies are born and people get married and you know, I just am more in touch on a regular basis with nieces and nephews and people I went to high school with up there in Northern Wisconsin. So it, it has this sort of feel good, um, you know, sense to, I mean, I just came back from a trip to Norway and all these people are like, oh my gosh, the pictures are beautiful, post more, you know? And so what would I do before? You know, there'd be no way to let people know I'd been to Norway and I have cool pictures. Right, right. You might have sent a card sometime with a, a photo card. Of yeah, a you and your card. husband right. or something or a postcard. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's really, right. really changed everything. And it's got pros and cons, as you've yeah. said. It's it's big. Well, and one other thing I want to mention too is educate, like especially with LinkedIn, we get more into that. LinkedIn has so many opportunities to provide information, tips, links to really helpful articles. It's amazing. It's, it's, I mean, all of them do in a way. I think it's one of the reasons as a former educator or aspiring educator, I identify so much with LinkedIn more than the other platforms, actually. Yeah. So let's kind of just chat about those. So, you know, the three that we talked about kind of hitting on were um, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and you're really a LinkedIn expert. D say a tiny bit about the other two first, just in terms yeah, of- Let's go to Instagram. Some of these are somewhat age driven. I would say Instagram in particular, and then Facebook too, to a degree. So Instagram is very, very visual. You go to Instagram, you're going to see pictures. You're going to also see these reels, these short videos, and very few words. Some words is okay. You can put words in there. Also, a lot of hashtags, a lot of the search terms, you know, with the pound sign, um, loads of those. So it's very quick. It's also usually very upbeat. Uh, at least my feed, uh, I don't see a lot of complainers. I don't see a lot of people expressing strong points of view on Instagram. Just again, my sense of it. Now, Facebook is kind of the, of course, it's huge. It has both visuals and it has more opportunity for text. And it has, um, sadly, I think so much now of the negativity and the back and forth and all of that. Um, but it has a blend. Now, Facebook, we always have to remember there's our personal Facebook and then ours our business page. Like I, I looked at your business page and it's really robust. You put a lot of time into it. You have posts on a regular basis. You've really leveraging your podcast then onto your Facebook. So that's a wonderful use of Facebook. Not that different really than LinkedIn from that standpoint. So that's where I think the intersection is between Facebook and LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn in the past, you didn't see like that many sort of, I'd say, personal type of posts on it. I think you see more, you see more um, points of view, say DEI, which, you know, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, of course, sadly has gotten controversial in some quarters, but anyway, so people feel strongly about something like that, let's say. Um, so then you will see posts along those lines. Or you will also see a post that I shared it, I was, so tickled to see all these people liked it. It was called 10 things you can do, 10, 10 things or qualities you can be at that don't cost you anything. Like be on time, um, do your homework, you know, be prepared, uh, just be go the extra mile. I mean, things like that. This lady in England had put it up and somebody had reposted it. And I love these so much that I reposted it. And now something like 1600 people have, seen it or at least reached it you know not that it yes yeah and i'm like whoa so you get these inspirational if you want to call them kinds of posts like kind of how to how to be a good person you know how to live right in the world you see those too so i mean again there is 
a bit of overlap between Facebook and LinkedIn in some regard in those ways. Yeah. And then further finish it out with LinkedIn. With LinkedIn, you can really research people. Unless they turn some things off, you can not only learn about them in their profile, you can go nose around in their activity and see what they've been posting, what they've been commenting on, what they've liked. Whereas Facebook, that you really can't do that unless you're a friend of the person, right? Think about it. You could go theoretically into their, per I'm talking personal now, personal side of Facebook and see what's up. So therefore, it's so interesting to learn about a person. Also, you're notified unless they turn you, you turn off, you know, the or they turn off the um, the different notifications. But if someone gets a new job, gets a promotion, things like that, so then you can do a lot of like I would call it at a girl, at a boy, that kind of community congratulations. So that's a good way to really nurture your relationships with people that you have in business life or personal too, really. So those are things that I think are really interesting about LinkedIn and just a kind of a richness of the posts you see. Very, very um, educational. Very educational. I there's I think of LinkedIn as being like weaving this um, like tapestry of people. And so how do you kind of weave this tapestry through your interaction and their interaction back and sharing? And LinkedIn mm -hmm. is the one I'm least tapped into. So I'm very intrigued by everything Joyce has to say about it, because I think that's the one that professionals go to, as you said, that that's mm -hmm. where there's really this professional colleague to colleague sharing that I think mm -hmm. is possible. Pretty I, amazing. Wonder, I wonder so you know when people have a lot of fears around this right they say they say you know just oh this is too complicated or I can't mm -hmm. remember the steps or th this all seems pointless what what for you has been the point in your business and how did you overcome those kind of fears let's go to like I forget how to do this <laughs> you know I still feel that way almost every month when I go to MailChimp to send out my newsletter like where do I go again? Or where do I start? Where's the template that I got to update? I like look around, look around. Well, there it is. I feel, frankly, note to self, I could just type up a little handwritten thing or just put it somewhere in my computer in a file and say steps for creating your newsletter, Joyce. So I think sometimes you get really basic and you list it out, boom, 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 and you know where to find it because you've got it's like cheat sheet folder or something like that. Right. So cheat sheet. Oh, I could use a cheat yeah, sheet folder. Yeah. I, I love that. A cheat sheet folder could really, really help. So part of it, that is logistics kind of. Then, but then there's this feeling like, what is the point? Now that depends on the person. Say you were still living your life in Michigan and you were fully retired and you're all like cozy and your daughters are older and you got the grandchildren and you're just doing this day to day life up there. Would you have a need for LinkedIn? Maybe not you know, really why. But let's say, conversely, you were always involved in Rotary back in Boulder when you lived there. And again, we'll just pretend you've just totally moved back to Michigan. And you like, oh, Rotary. Hmm, well, I'm going, uh, I'm going to Norway. Like I just went to Norway. Maybe I could catch a Rotary meeting while I'm there. Well, why not be on LinkedIn with the Rotary people? Think about it. So there's a lot of times as we age, we have the time, we have the money to give back to our communities. And sometimes the giving back can be in ways much bigger than just our little community. And we like the idea of being in touch with other people who have that same, um, what's the word, kindred spirit, that same, uh, same uh, kinship with that cause or whatever it might be. So I think there can even be a place for the retired person on LinkedIn within, you know, for certain types of purposes. Well, I can see, like you said, travel and connections and philanthropy and causes and things you care about and also like alumni of whether mm -hmm. it's of a career kind of alumni or, yeah. uh, you know, a school alumni. I get an enormous amount of LinkedIn invitations from teachers, right? So people reach out or LinkedIn sends me people and says, hey, you're probably going to be interested in this teacher because I've got a big teaching background. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to see that come forward. And then, of course, end of life people. So I think that, that this, this thing is to kind of create some enjoyable new connections mm -hmm. to create ways to have pastimes that are partly techie, 
-hmm. But I think to encourage, uh, you know, colleagues and friends not to be afraid of reaching out to these new things, which is where the tutor comes in, right? Because yeah, I, I actually made a little list of why I have a tutor. You yeah, know, why, thing, why a tutor? Right. A tutor can help kind of cut through all the noise. Men especially, I think, will go to YouTube and spend hours on YouTube to get the answer to whatever, you know, the little project they're doing. Women, this is a big generalization, of course, but like to ask for directions. They may want to have somebody else give them some feedback, like how does their profile look? So there's no one cookie cutter way to do a profile. So a person can, they're that dispassionate third party person, whatever you want to call them, who comes to you without, you know, any preconceived ideas about you and might say, oh, well, look at this. This section is missing. Or, you know what, that's a great about section, but after we've already talked, there's some cool things you could add to that. So be forthright. Then the other part is with the user side, let's take settings. A lot of older people are concerned about privacy. And fair enough, because certainly it's, I've been like hacked on Instagram, for example, it's, it's terrible. So you go in and I help people understand where the privacy settings are, how to make sure that their information isn't being used by the trusted third party, you know, partners and such, and then how to reduce the number of notifications that come in. Because in about 10, maybe 15 minutes, I can help a person just ratchet those notifications down. So all they're getting are the ones that really are relevant to them. Because they're retired, they're not looking for a job. You know, there's several things that don't apply to them. So we go in there and just ratchet them down. Let's say they're searching for somebody. So I can show them there's really cool, what they call filters. You can go, so say you're up there in Michigan and you're looking for people in the um, best life, best death space that you're in. And they're, you know, just want to kind of make some new associates up there. So you go in and you can pick cities, maybe not a geographic zip code, then you'd have to pay money. But you can go by like larger communities. You could go by certain kind of industries. You're looking for someone in healthcare and you can go and get what's called second level, meaning people that are connected to at least one of the people you're connected to. And then you want to meet that person. So hopefully your middle person, the one that you share the connection with, oh, I know Joyce here, let me introduce you. So it's a wonderful way to expand it. So I show people how to use these tools and I show them simple things like, okay, uh, you're going to post or you're going to engage with a post. You're going to share that post. You know what? You could go back to your own profile and you could actually feature that post on your profile. So when people come and look at you, they'll go, oh, what's that? Oh, that looks interesting. And you kind of keep changing it out a little bit. So those are things that the average person doesn't necessarily think to do on their own. Right. So that's where I would come in as a tutor. I wonder if I left anything out. Those are the main things. Oh, then, oh, I type up notes and I and I put them in a Word document. The older people love this so much. I've had people make binders and keep them. And I send them to the person with the email with my invoice. Now they have their little cheat sheet, right? Customized to them. That's the other thing I was going to say. Customized to them. Because otherwise you're just wandering around on the internet using your chat GPT or whatever AI tool you've maybe managed to figure out too, go you. But really, this is more efficient when you work with someone that has some experience with it and really is patient and listens and, you know, just help, gets very oriented toward you. Well, that's the thing I'm struck by. I remember one time, you know, early on in the Mac days, Macintosh computer days, taking like a Mac class. So there were, you know, 10 of us and somebody teaching. And within five minutes, I was like, oh, dear, this is not going to be relevant to me. Mm -hmm. It's too broad. It's too um, generalized. It doesn't really answer the questions I have. I already know what the person's covering. So then I switched to someone who was much more of a, you know, specific to my questions mm -hmm. and the efficiency of it has been really yeah. helpful and the yeah. specificity of it has been really helpful. Good so word. that makes sense to me that that's really what you can bring as a tutor. And, you know, what I love, Joyce, I love your enthusiasm because I feel like Part of what you're talking about is just this idea of how do we keep learning? How do we keep um, pushing ourselves? And I, gosh, I have to hold my parents up as examples because I feel like um, they're both in their 80s and they have 
always kind of stayed on top of the next technology. Wow. And as a result, here they are in their 80s, able to text easily with grandchildren mm -hmm. and so on. And I just think that's neat because I know other people in their 80s who kind of said, oh, I couldn't figure out my iPhone and I quit all that back when I was 72. Well, okay, that's an option as well. well what's the much you're losing out no on? judgment, but it's like you you miss out a huge amount of connection, I think, with younger generations when you back away from these things. That's so true. How do you how do you step into it in a way that makes it manageable and comfortable for you mm -hmm. and you know get the benefit of it? Yeah, those are, and one thing I was gonna say sometimes that I feel people they wear it like a bear like a badge of honor, sort of like, I don't gamble, like I don't do social media, like it's like evil. Right. And part of what I do, what is what I do, Diane, is I unpack it. So I'll say, let's just split things out here. We have, say, Snapchat. I don't have Snapchat. We have TikTok. You could try TikTok. Very cool. Looks like fun. You don't have to. So if things move too fast or like, I don't know, I'm going to get in trouble. Just don't do them or do it minimally. Then you have to say like Instagram. Okay, let's think of Instagram. So your granddaughter, your daughter, let's say, or maybe in case of your grand, your parents, the grandparents, so it's their great grandchildren. She she has a private Instagram account where she's putting up these pictures of these beautiful little children, and you'd kind of like to be in the loop of them. Okay, so we can get you a private Instagram account where you're only going to be on it with a handful of people. And that's the way to do it. Or say like Facebook, you could have a Facebook group. So then the daughter, the granddaughter has a Facebook group and all the pictures of the grandchildren come to the Facebook group. And so there's a degree of protection of everybody, especially the children, you think about it. So those, so I would say to take a platform and use it in a very discreet is sort of the word I want, but in a very specific way and really, um, be careful, use, this sounds fancy, but it's called two-factor authentication, which helps to protect other people from logging into whatever account it is. So sometimes you say, oh, it's such a pain when I have to text like your bank account. Like when I go into my bank account, trust me, there's, I have to go to my text and there's the number and I've got to put it in you know, to go online. Same concept. So I think that's, so I would just say, really think through which sites might help you be in touch with those younger people or other people you used to work with. So say, for example, you're not much a Facebook person, but you always really liked those coworkers you had, and maybe they're on LinkedIn. Who knows? They could be in some new iteration of themselves. So you could be on LinkedIn with them and still be kind of following along in their comings and goings. So that's how I would think about it. It's just kind of baby step your way into whatever sites really feel like you might want to try them. I like that. Like baby step your way in and think about what it is you want to get out of it. But there, there are things to get out of social media, mainly connection, I think is the big thing, right? Whether it's connection with family, connection with friends or mm -hmm. connection with interests and passions. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other angle, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Find people that uh, like for me, I'll take Toastmasters. We were talking about what's a hobby, what's a whatever. I'll call that a pastime. So one of the ways I got integrated into Denver, mm -hmm. having moved from Madison, which is only what 250,000 maybe with the suburbs, and I was an elected official there, League of Women Voters, sort of a somebody in a medium-sized town. And I come to the city of 2 million, and I know zero people, zero. Very, very hard. Well, then once I got into Toastmasters, the communication and leadership organization, skill building organization, my whole life changed because I met so many new people and I got better communicating. I got better leadership. It's just such an incredible community. So that would be an example like the Rotary or whatever, where you have this uh, kindred spirit group that you really resonate with. I, that's a, that's a great spot to, I think, end on what's a kindred spirit group, whether it's on social media or in person. And how do we find those? Because one of the things I've talked about before is, you know, this aspect of aging, one of the biggest things we need as we age is social connections. And that can look a lot of different ways, but we need them and it can be in person and it can be 
simply having a smiling at the cashier at the grocery store, or it can be this weaving of a tapestry on one of these social media platforms to create. And I might just do a quick little, just a quick little insert, meetup. Meetup.com is wonderful because people say they move to a new town, they retire to wherever, and they're looking for the bridge group, or they're going to learn Spanish, or whatever it might be, then they can find that on Meetup. So a lot of these are in person. Some some meetup groups are virtual. So that's the other. That's not really social media, but I think it kind of plays well with social media. Very much so. Meetup m e e t u p dot com. It started in New York City right after nine eleven. Did you know that? I did not. That's fast. They felt some people felt like we've got to bring people together face to face because we need each other. Because I thought it's crazy. That's so neat. And again, connected around passions and interests and commonalities. Right. That's so neat. Um, Joyce, you can find out more about Joyce at Boomer. There's two S's in there. Boomers Social Media tutor.com. And she's got some great information there. She's a lot of fun. I recommend if you're interested in having an expert on LinkedIn, walk you through it. Joyce would be a great person to reach out to. And um, I just appreciate your time, Joyce. I love your enthusiasm. And I love like, you know, both of us kind of did this reinvention midlife and um, have kind of jumped in with two feet to yep. social media that I was never involved with before. So it's been great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for your time. You've been listening to the Best Life, Best Death podcast, and you can find out more about the work I do at bestlifebestdeath.com. Thanks again to my guest today, Joyce Foistel. Thank you. <laughs>